what used to be the uh, Rijeka Regensburg lectures, which uh, now were transformed into a Southeast European research platform by the fact that the Center for Advanced Studies in Sofia also joined our, our initiative. Uh, the idea being to have a regular online format where research uh, for the time being mainly coming out of uh, Regensburg, Rijeka and, uh, and uh, Sofia, but we are certainly looking forward to expand our geographic scope uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, ongoing research is uh, presented. Those of you who have already joined one of our last seminars know that, that uh, it is usually two people who, uh, who speak and we try to find pairs that in a way match, which today actually we do because we have not only two historians, but it is also two historians of, of empire or of what has been left by empires. Uh, our first, our first uh, speaker is um, Abdul Hamid uh, Kirmisi, who uh, at, at, uh, is from Mamar University in Turkey. But uh, at the moment, I think you still are in Sofia, right? No, no, I left uh, Sofia two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I'm, I'm in so Istanbul. Fellow, now. fellow at the Center for Advanced, advanced uh, uh, Studies. And uh, Abdul Hamid is a historian of the Ottoman, of the Ottoman Empire. He defended a dissertation on, on rulers of the provincial empire, Ottoman governors and the administration of provinces from 1895 to 1908. Uh, uh, and he received his PhD from Boazici. University in in in in, in uh, Istanbul, and uh, he's going to speak today, yeah, about the project that uh, seems to come out of his dissertation research: an empire of uh, officials, Christians in the Ottoman bureaucracy. So it's a very very exciting uh, theme. And our second speaker will be Jeremy Walton, who has a PhD uh, from uh, from University of uh, Chicago in anthropology, actually but uh, who is now leader and also the applicant of an ESC consolidator grant project called Revenant, Revivals of Empire, Nostalgia, Amnesia, and Tribulation that is located at the University of, of uh, Rijeka. So uh, thanks to both of our speakers for agreeing to start the platform in its new form. And uh, without uh, further ado, I give over to Abdul. Hamid, please. Okay, um, thank you for inviting me for this program. Um, my uh, project in Sofia was on Christians in the late Ottoman bureaucracy. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, the 19th century was in many means important, but uh, for me it was um, that the Ottoman Empire underwent a massive process of state building and expansion of state functions creating tens of thousands uh, of new government jobs. And in this uh, uh, period of reconstruction, state reconstruction and bureaucratization, Christian officials' employment was an essential feature of the expanding modern uh, Ottoman bureaucracy. And um, this is a generally uh, shared observation, but there is not much um, it, it was not tested, let's say, thoroughly by using quantitative methods and archival materials. So my talk will uh, present the findings of my, my the outcomes of my project dealing with non-Muslim members of the Ottoman bureaucracy based on the personnel registers kept in uh, uh, uh, the last two decades and the first, uh, um, I mean, until until the First World War, let's say 1880s to 1914, consisting of 200 uh, large volumes that provided information on um, over 50,000 Ottoman officials. And um, I found out that almost... Uh, Let's see. I mean, this is the Sigil Ahval Defteller, the personnel registers. They are based on um, on the information given by the um, officials themselves. And um, yeah, here are the Sigil Ahval Defteller, um, the personnel records, um, which shows that you know almost three thousand 
uh, of the 50,000 were non-Muslim. That makes a uh, 6% uh, of the total. Um, the Christians and Jews, um, they were sh sharing their offices with the Muslims. Uh, in these uh, numbers, as you see, um, um, almost 1,500 Armenians, uh, a little more than 1,000 Greeks. Here by Greeks, I mean Rome. They don't have to be ethnic Greeks as we understand now. And uh, there are 303 Jews. And uh, if, as you see, um, this tiny little, little numbers also from um, the um, smaller uh, groups. So uh, we put this on Excel and then on the SPSS and um, and um, uh, actually one of my students who helped me at those that time, uh, um, uh, Gamze Ilaslan is also here. Uh, thank you for coming, Gamze. And um, I don't want to get much into the numbers. I want uh, to present you a narrative actually about these people, um, because talking about the numbers in uh, this kind of online dissertations doesn't make much fun. So uh, I will uh, rather give you an understanding of uh, who these people are and um, yeah. Um, this, this, uh, I mean, who, um, um, how, how they, they, they shared these offices and desks, desks as equal colleagues in this new uh, modern bureaucratic life. Um, um, they, these Muslims and Christians and Jews, they spoke each other's languages beside the. Uh, required operational uh, language of administration, what is Turkish, of course, and they benefited from the same networks of patronage and nepotism, um, which not only fostered um, easy hiring and promotion, but could also stop investigation or prosecution in cases of malpractices. Um, and the heads of the State Department's um, could be influential in recruiting their co-religionists. Um, um, and still, I will show you how connections and degree of intimacy with higher Muslim statesmen aided uh, non-Muslims um, in securing position and advancement. So in short, um, I want to show you how they shared a spirit of collegiality in a multi-confessional working environment. Um, so my talk will present daily uh, interactions of mostly petty officials from different confessional backgrounds in professional life. Uh, and uh, I will address their um, I will address their uh, sharing of common languages, uh, bureaucratic identity, uh, networks of patronage, and joint malpractices these four points as examples for a bureaucratic space of intercommunal life. So my question here is, was there a colleague solidarity connecting them beyond all communal identities? How far reached their confessional differences in importance? And uh, what common networks and joint uh, malpractices or practices, let's say, were they part of? Um, but as an example, how could corruption, graft, and impropriety unite these people of different communal backgrounds? So the first uh, is then uh, speaking, uh, the first point is speaking the same language. Um, the first modern written constitution, the Kanuni Asasi of 1878, um, which was the pinnacle of Ottoman legisl uh, legislation at its time, asserted that all subjects of the empire are called Ottomans, as you see here in the slide, without distinction, whatever um, um, faith they uh, profess. And the most crucial article in res respect to the issue of uh, uh, um, state employment was Article 19, which said all Ottomans are admitted to public offices. 
However, to be able to attain this right, one had to know Turkish and the constitution declared this necess necessity in a Article 18. Eligibility to public office is conditional on a knowledge of Turkish, which is the official language of the state. So Turkish was the operational language of the Ottoman bureaucracy and all officials knew Turkish, albeit in, uh, at different levels. Um, as uh, uh, to be seen in these uh, personnel records, they could at least expose their intention in Turkish, as it is written there. İfade-i meram edecek derecede Türkçe okuyup yazdı in one of the files, uh, in, a, in a file of Dimitri, who was a provisionary small scribe at the Hijaz Railroad. There are rare cases of officials as such who lacked a functional language of Turkish. For example, in 1904, Mihal, a Greek from Chios Island, was appointed in his hometown when he was 40 as a mounted tax collector, Suvari Tahsildarı. Uh, it is written that he did not know Turkish, but could speak a little and knows the Turkish numbers. So, uh, and at another island, Rhodes, a Jew named David was appointed at age 53 as a pet, uh, pedestrian tax collector, Piyade Tahsildarı. Similarly, he was, he does not know how to read and write Turkish, but is able to count in Turkish. So counting in Turkish was good enough for a Jewish or um, Greek tax collecting agent on an island populated mainly by Greeks. And um, Greek um, was uh, Rumja, I mean Rum, uh, was the second most widely known uh, uh, foreign language among the Jewish officials after French. Greek was the native language of Romanian Jews, not only the Greeks themselves, uh, but the high rate of the Greek speakers uh, um, among the 40% of the Jewish officials also says a lot of intercommunal and uh, relations and socialization. Um, um, uh, the uh, geographical backgrounds of the Greek speaking Jews overlap with the provinces with the largest Greek concentrations in the empire. This is also the case for the uh, Armenians. Um, in contrast, only three officials, Jewish officials, knew Armenian, very few Jewish officials hailed from Inner Anatolia, um, where the Armenians were most populous. Um, and in Istanbul, Jews were in closer contact with the Greeks than with Armenians in their interactions, interactions with other uh, uh, uh, Ottoman, um, um, than with other uh, Ottoman non-Muslim communities. So a similar outcome is relevant for Anatolian languages other than Turkish. The Armenian Ohanis Efendi from the town of Çölük in district of Çapakçur was able to write in Turkish and Armenian and could understand the Zaza language. In return, many Muslim officials were acquainted with um, uh, or could understand Ashina or Tefehüm eder. Um, the Armenian language. The Armenian-speaking Muslims seem to be of Southern Anatolian origin. Um, from, for example, from Bitlis, Mustafa Rami and Fetullah Sami were the twin grandsons of a known Muslim scholar, and Shemsi was a son of a tradesman. I mean, all these three Kurds uh, served as simple clerks in their in their hometown and had a classical madrasa education. They were only able to write in Turkish, but could speak Kurdish and Armenian, and Shemsi could also sp speak Persian. Türkçe kitabet ve Farisi ve Kürdi ve Ermeni lisanlarıyla tekellüm eder. Um, another area of such interaction was uh, common schooling. In their childhood, some visited each other's community schools, Greeks went to Armenian schools or uh, Bulgarian schools. Armenians visited Greek and Bulgarian schools. Um, but apart from schooling, uh, Turkish 
was not uh, exclusively learned at school, but also from private tutors, which we, which the, which the source, the Sigilia Ahval registers call muallimi mahsus. Um, they were mostly Turks who were teaching this Turkish language to the non-Muslims. Um, and many files suggest that the Turkish language skills were also later improved and perfected uh, with working experience in the officialdom. Um, not only Turkish, but uh, the officials, the colleagues also learned each other's languages in their career stations. Um, for example, Mihran Boyajian, an Armenian Kaimakam uh, district uh, governor, uh, of Murefte, which was populated mainly by Greeks, um, um, could, uh, or, or he learned uh, uh, speaking and writing Greek uh, while he was district governor there. So um, this must help the Armenian not only in his appointment as a sub-governor of Limnos, another you know Greek populated island um, in um, September 1912, but also during his short captivity, Mihran Boyajian's short captivity um, in the Balkan Wars, uh, when uh, yeah, when Greece occupied uh, the island, and uh, so depending on time and place, knowing Greek could be essential for Muslim bureaucrats as well. For example, um, Abdullah Ragıp Pasha was appointed in 1896 as governor to Kandia, Kandia in, in, in Crete, but shortly after he was dismissed in October uh, after you know two uh, months in office because he didn't know the language of the island people. The governor general of the governor general of Crete, Zihni Pasha, demanded Instead, in, instead of uh, Abdullah Ragıp uh, Pasha, uh, someone who knew Greek. So this was so far for the language sharing of languages, uh, a couple of um, uh, examples. Uh, we can move on with, um, you know, collegiality, I mean, uh, uh, above everything else, being civil servant above um, everything else. Uh, um, as uh, I have shown you before in the uh, uh, slides, the non-Muslims entered the civil service by taking an oath on the Old and New Testaments in front of their relevant ministers and seniors, as did Muslims on the Quran. Uh, and offices were closed during the Christian holidays. Non-Muslim officials and provincial notables uh, more wore uh, official dresses showing their ranks and medals during their religious holidays, uh, like Easter, and um, uh, the clerks of the same department were at times rewarded together. Um, there are many uh, um, examples for this, and all these uh, practices served for uh, a shared spirit of collegiality. So they were Ottoman colleagues sharing offices and desks before anything else, identifying these people only with their confessions and attempting to impose coherence upon their disparate experiences runs the risk uh, of missing the significance of the rich tapestry of identities uh, in which they lived as imperial subjects. And um, as you see also in the um, so, uh, in the slides, uh, these uh, all these different identities and loyalties, they could overlap with one another, um, so they were not uh, necessarily exclusive or in conflict. We um, know nowadays more from other sources, uh, other other books that. You know, these national identities uh, and ethnic identities were actually born within the context of the empire. So in the imperial context could actually um, um, 
positively uh, have an effect on on you know um, uh, on this on these kind of uh, uh, new identities, let's say. So um, what uh, here is important for us is that Ottomanness was the uh, umbrella identity uh, for all these officials I'm talking about. And um, with their oath, with their uniforms, with their medals, uh, these non-Muslim officials were part of this civil officials, uh, officialdom. And this is actually why in the eyes of many European observers, non-Muslim officials were regarded as proper Turks. In her diary, Lady Lyard, the wife of the British ambassador to Istanbul, mentions um, um, in a dinner uh, 11 Turks uh, who participated in this dinner, among which she counts the Armenian Serkis Efendi and the Rum Sava Pasha. So she talks about them uh, as if they were uh, Turks. I mean, uh, I mean, attention to how Turks is used uh, by these foreign observers when they are talking about the statesmen, about the bureaucracy. In another uh, example, as you see also in the slides, um, when the governor, when when when this uh, when Sava Pasha was a governor of Crete uh, in 1885, a British report described him as having pushed his uh, religious uh, impartiality to the point that it was commonly said of him that he was more Turk than Christian. Here, Turk is used as a Muslim, as you see. So indeed, Sava Pasha served Muslim culture actually more uh, than uh, uh, many of his colleagues, let's say, more, many of his Muslim or Turkish colleagues, as he penned uh, uh, praised books on the theory of, uh, and yeah, and, and the practice of the Muslim law, as you see here uh, in the slide, Etudes sur la théorie du droit musulman, le tribunal musulman, le droit musulman, expliqué, um, um, and uh, speaking of uh, books, actually many Muslims and Christian bureaucrats, Muslim and Christian bureaucrats uh, wrote and published some pieces together. And here you see other examples, how Yorgaki, Melacrino and Talat wrote a commentary on the law of criminal procedure together or uh, how Sahak Abro translated Machiavelli's Prince together with uh, Rufat Pasha uh, and uh, so on. Um, back to uh, loyalties and identities. Um, um, yeah, maybe any, another example uh, before moving on with the next, uh, with the third issue. Uh, Victor Bey, uh, the son of a Greek major uh, uh, Dr. Andoniaki Hristaki Pasha serves at the, served as the director of foreign affairs in Salonika for three years at the end of the century. And during the Greek war uh, in 1897, uh, when citizens of Greece were expelled, he managed to, con to convince 2,000 of those Ejnebi Greeks, I mean, not Ottoman uh, citizens, this Ejnebi, this foreign Greeks, to change their nationalities and accept Ottoman citizenship. Um, and uh, this information was provided in his file, for his by, file by Reza Pasha, the head of the Imperial Immigration Commission, after Victor's dismissal, dismissal due to some invalid accusations. Um, after this last example, I will move on with uh, the third issue, how they benefited from the same networks. Um, um, under this giant project I have talked about at the beginning, this state building, actually reinvention of the Ottoman state in the Tanzimat times in the um, uh, um, um, uh, 19th century, uh, of, but better after 1840s, let's say. Um, education and expertise counted more than in ages past, and the doors of the state employment opened wide to virtually 
anyone with the needed qualifications. So, but this doesn't mean that the traditional kinds of networks like nepotism and patronage um, in greasing the employment and promotion uh, heels was uh, extinguished. The waning of the conventional importance of family ties and patronage is part of the Weberian uh, definitions of modern bureaucratic transformation, emphasizing objective criteria in employment and promotion. However, this, this famous ideal type of Max Weber uh, does not reflect uh, the whole truth about modern bureaucracies. Even today, um, and um, I think um, uh, it should be treated as an apology for the modern state, but um, we have to be careful to, to think that this was applicable always and ever in modern times. Uh, but for sure, yes, for sure, uh, influential statesmen mediated for friends and relatives. They constantly uh, tried to intrude their relatives into state service uh, and take care uh, of them afterwards and help their promotion and prevent them from being sent to remote areas, for example. We can see all these in Ottoman documents and also in the Sijil Ahval registers. In the prosopographical manual of thousand statesmen in the uh, late Ottoman higher echelons, uh, Sinan Kunaralp had presented this nopotic relations. You see it in the slide. Uh, and um, there uh, we can see also uh, among these uh, uh, statesmen with uh, nepotic relations, there are also non-Muslim civil servants with uh, father-son relationships, sibling, cousin, uncle, nephew relationships. And uh, there are dozens of such examples, some of which you can see at the, in the slide. So Muslims and non-Muslim shared the same networks of, uh, um, of uh, appointment and promotion and uh, protection in the system, uh, connections and degrees of intimacy with higher Muslim statesmen aided non-Muslims in the system. Uh, and uh, I mean, in, in securing their positions and um, um, advancement, uh, denominational affiliations and the shared religious identity uh, did not circumscribe careers. Um, so the what I want to say here is this these networks of support of climbers were not limited to co-religionists and um, um, yeah religion religion was not the determining element in the uh, patronage relations and this supra uh, communal networks continued to exist. Um, Namu Kemal, for example, the famous uh, uh, writer and um, yeah, I mean intellectual. Um, uh, as you see, I mean we can we can find from his uh, letters which were published recently that he has this kind of relations. Um, he was promoting uh, his Armenian friends uh, um, to posts or um, uh, vice versa. Another good example is Mavreyuni, Mavreyuni Pasha, the Greek court physician of Abdul Hamid II. Um, how he used his influence, he gained on the Sultan through his loyalty. Uh, and uh, he used this uh, uh, influence not only for his family members, which was quite normal um, for that time, or other Greek doctors, uh, but he used this influence also for Armenians and Muslims to work in other government offices, as you see in my examples in the slide. Um, then we have uh, also, um, yeah, joint malpractices. The la my last point, when it comes to moral qualities, uh, there was no distinction between 
officials of different confessions too. Uh, the mentioned uh, Layard, for example, the British um, um, ambassador in Istanbul um, stated in one of his speeches that the corruption of the subordinate, of, subordinate officials, which extends more or less through every class, paid or unpaid, Turk or Christian, often defeats the good faith and intentions of the party, he says. So um, it doesn't have, uh, it was not, uh, you know, just the case for um, the Turkish officials, uh, he says. So this kind of foreign observers were very well aware that corruption, graft, and impropriety united the officials from different walks. Um, and here I also provided for you some examples. I don't want to read them uh, all. Um, uh, uh, you can read it for yourself. Uh, so the Ottoman documents use ishtirak, müşterek, bil ishtirak for this kind of joint malpractices when they are talking about, you know, this kind of um, um, uh, things which were malpractices, which were becoming a case for courts. The, these are all re recorded in the um, um, Sigil Ahval registers, you know, this, this personnel registers of the Ottoman bureaucracy. And um, yeah, endless, uh, here are uh, some, some, some of these, uh, examples, as you see, uh, which are very interesting. Um, just let me choose one of them. Yeah, the file of Yordanaki, for example, the inspector of justice in Diyarbakir and Elaziz. Um, uh, the file is packed with exciting crimes. Locals were talking about his taking bribes and complaining about his intimacy with notables. Uh, this Greek official helped an Armenian monk, for example, charged with rape to get cleared in return for one wagon of wine and one ram, uh, uh, Sharap and Koch, Bir Koch. Yordanaki was also part of a split among the local officials and was in alliance with the Muslim chief judge Shevket Efendi against the other party. Or, um, um, yeah, uh, what else? Yeah, we have an Armenian uh, doctor who takes bribes to provide health reports for Muslim men from Aksaray to, uh, who wanted to escape from the military duty. Or we have a district governor in Sivas, Kostaki Efendi, who was accused of taking a cow and a young bull as bribe from the Armenian Nazareth A to appoint him as a member of a court. I mean, yeah, um, this kind of uh, interesting uh, cases are to find in um, the files. Um, yeah, maybe a, a, a last uh, example for this joint malpractices could be drinking and getting drunk together in the offices. Um, uh, uh, Istefan Efendi, um, an Armenian, uh, was, uh, yeah, I uh, know this was not about drinking. Uh, Oh yeah, here are interesting uh, examples for drinking together. For example, in the Ramazan, Ramazan Sharifte, Christian Larla Beraber, Alenen Ishret, the director of a post office uh, in Shkodra, Mehmet Nazmi, uh, was dismissed because he publicly drank with Christians during Ramadan, or the post officer's Talat uh, and his Greek colleague Tanash went drunkenly to the telegraph office and at night and danced. So this kind of cases are also seen in the files. Um, yeah, I mean, as we have seen in these uh, examples, um, there are 
many ways to present daily interactions of petty officials from different ethnic and religious backgrounds in professional life. Uh, here I address their sharing of common languages, bureaucratic identity, networks of patronage, and their joint malpractices. The uh, heterogeneity of Ottoman society and was and will always be fascinating, but still the history of her non-Muslims in the era of emerging nation states is merely constrained with stories of conflict, violence, victimhood, or suppression. Um, and on the other hand, they are usually uh, they are also penned around the romantic and nostalgic theme of Ottoman tolerance. Um, generally that of the state uh, to its people. Um, um, but archival sources impose additional constraints by grossly overlooking the social processes. Um, the immediate immense daily contact at the office provides a collegial culture for employee engagement beyond established identities. Collegiality creates such an intimate companionship that in the end, becomes far more important of affiliation than ethnic or confessional identities can supply. Muslim, Christian, and Jewish professionals at the same office um, have had more in common with their colleagues than their co-religionists. Um, and the 19th century Ottoman official institutions were adhesively imposing an imperial Ottoman identity upon the tapestry of religious and ethnic identities. Um, yeah, I guess my time is up here. I could, uh, I can can talk uh, much longer, but let it be. Let it. Let me stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Abdul Hamid, for this really very interesting uh, talk, and probably for most of us, or all of us, really very very new because very few of us know much about the Ottoman Ottoman Empire. Um, I think we, we now can move on to our second speaker, Jeremy, um, who is uh, going to talk about Ottoman past in the Balkan present on ironies and absences of collective memory. So we have an Ottoman focus in, in our today's platform meeting. Jeremy, please. Mm. Thank you so much, Ulf. I'll now do my best to share the screen. You can hear me, I take it. Yes, yes. Fantastic. Uh, uh, so first, I'll begin with a, a few caveats and uh, points of order, as I often do with my presentations. Uh, I'd like to, uh, of course, thank Ulf uh, for this really kind invitation. It's especially gratifying uh, to join you uh, online in this virtual format. Uh, because uh, Ulf has so kindly agreed to be one of the uh, one of the members of the advisory board for the Revenant project, uh, which I'm now leading at the University of Rijeka, Revivals of Empire, Nostalgia, Amnesia, uh, Tribulation. I believe another member of our advisory board, Vieran Pavlakovic from uh, from the University of Rijeka himself, is also somewhere in the audience out there. Uh, so uh, just uh, to give you a sense of where we'll be heading, I do have a. I'm going to time myself uh, because I do have a tendency to be a bit verbose. Uh, so I'll keep myself to 30 minutes. And then if I go over a little bit, hopefully that won't be uh, too intrusive upon your time. Uh, for those of you who happen to be repeat attenders, uh, if not repeat offenders, uh, that is to say repeat attenders to one of my presentations, you'll have to forgive me if I cover some of the same material and metaphorical ground that I often do, uh, since I do uh, have a tendency to want to lay out the broad contours and commitments of our Revenant project and my own research within that before moving to some specific sites. Also, I should uh, not neglect to thank Abdul Hamid for the this wonderful uh, uh, sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a nice sort of pairing. We move now from Ottoman history to Ottoman memory, as it were. Um, so with that, I'll uh, get us started, uh, and hopefully my screen uh, will come through uh, clearly to all of you. Uh, as some of you know, I like to begin these sorts of lectures with an image because, as we know, uh, images often do speak uh, a thousand words or more. So what you see here is meant as a place 
placeholder in some sense, both for the uh, broad themes and uh, to some degree arguments that I'll be raising in this talk, but also uh, perhaps even more so for the commitments uh, of our project as a whole. This is uh, something that I happened to come across at the Zagreb Ethnographic Mu Museum in January 2020, just before I suppose it was to shut down for a while, like everything else. Uh, this was a, an ethnographic, uh, an ethnographic exhibition on headgear from a variety of contexts, both Balkan and otherwise. And this is, of course, a Bosnian headdress uh, from uh, the 19th century. Now, what's fascinating here, of course, is that you can see uh, this sort of spectacular display of lukur, uh, the, the sort of coins, the numismatic kind of, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, what's the phrase that we use in anthropology? Uh, uh, conspicuous consumption here. But the coins, of course, are from two different empires. Uh, on the top, you can see uh, Ottoman Kurush. I can't tell uh, which Torah that is. Actually, Abdul Hamid might be able to make it out. Probably Abdul Medjit or Abdul Aziz, maybe Abdul Hamid II. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, a 19th century Ottoman Kurush, uh, whether, uh, whether from uh, whichever emperor it represents. And then on the bottom, of course, you can perhaps make out the somewhat scuffed uh, profile of, of course, Maria Theresa, uh, the Habsburg Empress. It's a, it's a Habsburg so, of course, Bosnia is one of these sites where you have these constellations and integrations of the inter-imperial, and, and yet at the same time you have this object presented at, in this context, this museal context, as a post-imperial sort of entity. So, again, just as a shorthand, the post-imperial and the inter-imperial, that's really what uh, the project Revenant and indeed my own research within it is all about how these post-imperial, inter-imperial formations and sites of memory uh, exist today. So for the next couple of slides, again, I'll just give you some, uh, some orienting conceptual and theoretical material uh, for the three sites that we'll visit. And I should say we will be visiting three specific sites, one in Croatia, the fortress of Klis, one in Thessaloniki, uh, the so-called Yeni Jami of the Denme community there, and one in uh, in Sarajevo in Bosnia, the Sebil uh, or Sebil uh, fountain, which is of course an icon of the city. Not in that order, I got it mis mistaken. But uh, first, a few uh, conceptual uh, uh, signpost, if you were. So as I've already said, a commitment to inter-imperial, post-imperial sites of memory. I won't read these quotes to you. I, I think you can get a sense from them. Uh, Laura Doyle, a wonderful scholar of comparative literature, emphasizing inter-imperiality is a concept that should be theorized comparable to international, which we, of course we take so uh, uh, for granted, the international, right? But when you start talking about the inter-imperial, you get a very different sense of geography and history. Uh, Anne and Laura Stoller, a wonderful influential anthropologist whom I imagine many of you know, and her insistence that imperial formations, as she calls them, sort of represent the afterlives and continuities of empire in the present. So a sort of shorthand for the post-imperial, but with an emphasis on continuity rather than rupture. And then finally, Pierre Nora's uh, quite uh, famous and to, to some infamous argument about Lieu des Memoirs, uh, really just taking that notion of sites of memory as particularly um, potent crucibles for the kinds of textures of imperial pasts in the present that we're interrogating. Again, vis-a-vis -vis the specific uh, lecture, I should say that uh, only one of the sites that I'll be visiting is clearly inter-imperial, uh, and that will be, uh, of course, Sarajevo. To some degree, the Klis Fortress in, uh, uh, above Split is inter-imperial, though a, a little bit less so, and, and the site in Thessaloniki is not especially inter-imperial, but they're all post-imperial lieu de mémoire. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me, I've been suffering from allergies here as spring has sprung in Zagreb, uh, which is where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, so uh, again, I'm going to just be very uh, brief here because I think uh, a lot of these arguments will spin off into orbits that we don't necessarily need to attend to today. But an interest in this project uh, and in this lecture as well in the relationship between, on the one hand, collective memory and its sort of insistence on examining the variety of ways in which the past 
is shaped by the present for pre the interests and needs of the present. Uh, and that's what these quotes from Hallbach, from Trujillo are emphasizing, of course, Svetlana Boim's notions of restorative and uh, reflective nostalgia being quite key to this entire conversation within memory studies. On the other hand, however, an insistence that memory cannot uh, entirely encompass uh, capaciously all of the ways in which the past remains present and influential in the present. So uh, here we have to also uh, attend to silences or to what uh, Stoller, the anthropologist I mentioned, would call occlusions, amnesia, uh, oblivion from the anthropologist Marc Auger, if you prefer. Um, and uh, drawing on Todorova, whom of course uh, uh, I imagine many of us are uh, quite familiar with and engaged with, thinking about legacies as encompassing, and this is the quote, of course, encompassing everything chosen or not that is handed down from the past. So this insistence that there are aspects that uh, memory might not be able to fully digest and regurgitate that nonetheless are exerting pressure on the present. In other work, I've really summarized this quite insufficiently, but I think, I hope uh, somewhat uh, heuristically as memory, uh, understood as the pressure that actors in the present place upon the past, whereas legacy is the pressure that the past places upon actors in the present. So that kind of uh, dichotomous, but also dialectical uh, rendering. Finally, and this is, I think, more important, and this is really more the novel aspects of, of, of this presentation in particular. So uh, maybe what I want to emphasize here by way of a, a somewhat long introduction, I, I realize, uh, I recently have been reading through again Susan McDonald's wonderful book on difficult heritage vis-a-vis -vis Nuremberg and the way in which uh, the Nazi parade grounds have been treated or not treated in the present, uh, well, really from the 1980s or so on. She has this kind of long deray of her own research. Uh, but uh, these sites that we're going to be dealing with today are not difficult in the same way, certainly not in the same way that Nuremberg is, yet I think there is a sort of point of uh, comparison there. So I want to think about these as rather than difficult called uh, heritage, ironic heritage. And I'm going to say more about what I mean by that throughout the lecture. Um, but briefly, there's a whole, of course, vast literature in, uh, in comparative uh, literature and literary theory on irony. I'm not going to get into all of it, but uh, drawing on uh, one literary critic, David Kaufer, a notion that irony necessarily implies perspectival difference and that the sort of engagement and mobilization of that perspective spectival difference of irony can be a method to unsettling and indeed rendering difficult heritage, which is often sanitized in the present. Uh, and so when we're talking about the Balkans, of course, we again can draw on Todorova's notion that it's absurd to talk about an Ottoman legacy in the Balkans because the Balkans are the Ottoman legacy. Uh, so examining the ironies of that legacy in these different sites is a way to unsettle them and to in some sense, draw out the difficulties that are, are that are that are present there—a way of unsilencing, if you will. Um, so, in one of my recent lectures, I got a question uh, after uh, the uh, the uh, the presentation, which essentially was, "What is your argument?" And that was a question I wasn't quite prepared for at the time, because I think, in some ways, once you start delving into the protein uh, continuities and contrast of these different sites, you're not really arguing one thing. But I do actually, therefore, have an argument for you here today. So. I I just want to spell it out right now. The argument is that, uh, namely, nationalist heritage in post-imperial contexts, particularly in the Balkans, but I think this is broader, of course, produces highly ironic situations. That's the argument. So if you take away nothing more from the lecture, you can take away that. Um, what I'm going to do now, of course, is to move to our three specific sites. We're going to begin in Thessaloniki. And what we'll see here is that uh, uh, despite that very abstract argument that I've made, there are different ironies in these different sites. So the first is uh, the, that we'll move to will be what I call a neo-Ottoman or neo-Ottomanist, perhaps, irony. The second will be a nationalist irony. And the third will ultimately be an orientalist irony. Um, so again, you can keep that in mind as well. First then, let's visit uh, Salonika, uh, Mark Mazower's City of Ghosts, and indeed Mazower is part of the story uh, that, uh, that lies behind uh, this brief tip of the iceberg that I'm giving you today. 
Here you have an image of the Yeni Jami, uh, the new mosque in Thessaloniki, a, a wonderful construction dating from 1902 uh, by the star architect of the late Ottoman period in Salonika, uh, the uh, Italian architect Vitaliano Poselli. Uh, he did a lot of the buildings actually from that era that you might recognize if you're familiar with Salonika. Um, already you can see from this image that I took uh, during one of my visits uh, to the new mosque that uh, something's a bit off here. You you have the sign in Greek that says Archaeologicon Museon, so Archaeological Museum. Well, this gives you a sense of the palimpsestic and layered uh, history of the uh, of the structure, even though it's only at this point about 120 years old. Let me give you uh, another uh, image of it. I actually just found this one recently. There you can see the minaret uh, behind it, which of course doesn't exist any longer today. I need to pause now to tell you a bit more about not so much the structure itself, but the community that it serviced in order for you to appreciate the ironies of heritage here, and in particular, the ironies of Neo-Ottoman heritage. The Yeni Jami, uh, as many of you uh, may know, was the house of worship for Thessaloniki's thriving late Ottoman Denme community. The Denme, uh, about whom Mark uh, Baer, rather than Mazaur, uh, has written the authoritative book, so I can point you in his direction, were uh, the ancestors of the community that converted en masse to Islam in 1666, the followers of the self-proclaimed Jewish Messiah Sabatai Sevi, originally from Smyrna, born in 1626, I think, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, a Sephardi or perhaps Romaniat uh, Jew who was deeply immersed in Kabbalah and eventually considered himself to be the Messiah at the behest of Mah uh, Mahmoud the, is it Mehmet, Mehmet the fourth, I think it was, uh, in 1666. Uh, he was given the choice of execution or conversion, converted to Islam, uh, as did his followers, eventually died in exile in Ultsin, in what's today Montenegro, interestingly enough, a site that I still would like to visit sometime soon, if possible. Uh, but his uh, followers continued to practice their uh, Kabbalistic devotion to Sabatai Sevi, though technically as Muslims, according, of course, uh, to the Milet system uh, for the next uh, several centuries uh, until the end of the Ottoman Empire. They were particularly um, uh, economically uh, and socially uh, efflorescent in Thessaloniki, in Salonika, and indeed at the turn of the century in that Findesiak moment, felt the need for a new house of worship, and hence you have uh, the commission to Vitaliano Poselli, this wonderful sort of Rococo neo-Moorish uh, mosque, because of course, as technical, technically Muslims, they worshipped in a mosque. That wasn't to last very long, of course. You have World War, the Balkan Wars, World War I. You have uh, finally the Treaty of Lausanne and the population exchanges of 1923, which because the Dernme were technically Muslims and were not Muslims from the Thracian area in what's now the easternmost part of Greece, you, the two exceptions being Muslims of that area and of course the Rome uh, of Istanbul, they were required to, uh, to relocate to uh, the newly formed Turkish nation state, the Turkish Republic, where uh, they essentially were dissolved very quickly within the powerful solvent of Turkish nationalism. You have very few Denme today, despite the uh, Con continuity of Dernme as this sort of conspiracy theory uh, identity, which is an interesting story in its own right, but not directly pertinent here. So the mosque in 1923 becomes the archaeology museum. I, I went there a bit quickly. Um, that lasts until 1960. So again, I can move back one here. You can see still the archaeological uh, museum sign on the facade of the Yeni Jami or Genitsami as it's rendered in Greek. Uh, in the 1960s, the city needs a larger archaeological museum. And so since that time, the structure stands relatively empty, technically owned by the municipality, or at least administered by it. I need to look more actually into the ownership question. Uh, occasionally, the host to uh, art exhibitions. And that's what you see here. Uh, this is a photo on the right that I took uh, when I visited in the aftermath of an art exhibition. I think it's kind of a nice uh, indication of the sort of informality in the aftermath of a, an exhibition, just sort of the litter that's on the floor there uh, next to the mirab or in front of the mirab. Uh, one of the interesting uh, interventions in terms of exhibition space that was made in recent years was in 2017 
2017, the sacred, Shared Sacred Sites exhibition partially curated um, by a scholar, many of you may know, Karen Barkey, uh, which had a variety of uh, exhibition spaces across the city, but the, the new mosque was one of them. There you had uh, uh, uh, artwork such as this from the uh, artist Lydia Dambassini, uh, reflecting on the sort of, uh, lost traces of that cosmopolitan uh, intercommunal uh, Findesiek aspect of Salonika that Mazauer, of course, uh, and most famously uh, writes about, you know, where is this from? Is this a Jewish tomb or from a Muslim tomb? Uh, of course, referencing most famously, perhaps the gigantic Jewish cemetery upon which Aristotle University uh, built its campus, but also the tombstones that one might find discarded in, say, the Garden of the Rotunda there in uh, Thessaloniki, which was, of course, once a mosque, which had been a church, which once was a temple <laughs> of uh, uh, a pagan temple, as it were, back in the day. Uh, so again, this sense of the lost uh, plural Ottoman past. However, that past has uh, uh, undergone some extraordinary uh, renovations and resuscitations in recent decades, particularly under the um, the guidance of now former mayor Janos Butaris of Thessaloniki, who looked to the Ottoman era as a real source of uh, cultural, uh, social, and economic capital for his city, and indeed actively supported a whole series of initiatives to uh, foster a new image of the city as primarily rooted in that Jewish and Ottoman past, especially Jewish past, but also Ottoman past. So what you have here is a very interesting uh, and indeed ironic, and this is the neo-Ottoman irony, uh, outcome of that neo-Ottoman image of the city. Uh, so a group of uh, madrasa students from Gimuljine, Komotini, I believe, uh, which is in this uh, region of Greece, which was not subject to the, uh, which, in which Muslims were allowed to stay and were not required to relocate to the Turkish Republic, came to the, the new mosque to perform uh, the noon prayer on Saturday, interestingly enough, <laughs> with the uh, special permission of Janus Butaris. Now, uh, I have to be a bit quick, but the ironies here are deep because the notion that uh, this madrasa is almost certainly uh, staffed by uh, by teachers who are taught the Dianet version of Turkish Sunni Hanafi Islam, nothing like what the Donme would have been do doing uh, in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century as part of their ritual uh, <laughs> life. And yet the notion that this is a somehow appropriate reappropriation and revivification of the of the uh, of the site is is indeed exactly what I mean by ironic heritage. Here, the irony is in this sort of neo Ottoman concept itself, uh, because uh, as uh, I believe Nora Fisher Onar has uh, most notably uh, argued, you have this this dynamic where you have on the one hand a Belle Epoque neo neo Ottomanism that refers to the sort of plurality and cosmopolitanism of the late empire, you also have this sort of more Islamic imperial neo-Ottomanism that looks to the 16th century and in particular Kanuni uh, Suleiman, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. Here, what's interesting is that on the one hand, you have this plural, this sort of image of Ottoman pluralism that's being sort of mapped on to the city of Thessaloniki to revivify it. But in fact, the sort of modes of, uh, of reappropriation and worship are in, are more befitting of this other form of more imperial Islamic neo-Ottomanism. So there's much more to be said there, but I'm going to move on now uh, to another site, one a bit closer to my home. Uh, here we are now, uh, so we're moving now from neo-Ottoman ironies uh, to ironies of nationalist heritage. So this is Klis uh, Fortress, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who've been to Split in Croatia, it looms above the city uh, in the, the, the capital of uh, the Dalmatian region uh, in a dramatic form. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about its history. Here you see uh, a photograph uh, that I took last summer uh, and then a somewhat anachronistic uh, rendering of the Ottoman version of the Kale uh, from 1704. So its origins date back 
to the misty times of Illyrian rebellions against uh, incipient Roman colonialism in the Eastern Adriatic, but it was uh, a, a fortress of, uh, at one point, a host, hosted medieval Croatian kings. Uh, by the 16th century, which is the era that concerns us, it had become the seat of the Uskokci, uh, the Uskoks, the famous uh, irregular pirateering, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, that I'm looking for here, uh, men of fortune, I suppose you might say, of the Eastern Adriatic, led by Petar Kruzic. It was attacked by the Ottomans in, I believe it was 1537, seized and then became the seat of the Klis uh, Sanjak within the Bosna Eoleti uh, until 1669, I believe, uh, all these dates and places, uh, when it was taken by the Venetians as part of the Candian Wars. So it was indeed a major Ottoman fortress overlooking the Adriatic for many years, but you will learn very little of that today if you uh, visit uh, Klis uh, and uh, the fortress there. Uh, one of the fascinating, and one of the, I mean, th this is a more complicated story, of course, as they all are, but I'm, I'll be quick and easy about it. One of the most fascinating aspects, particularly for someone who's accustomed to the architectural design of mosques uh, from the Ottoman era in the Balkans especially, is to visit and see quite clearly that uh, the church in the uh, in the Kale, if you know that it was an Ottoman uh, fortress, this is of course something you'll be looking for, was clearly once a mosque. It was known simply as the Kale Jami, Jami Kale Jami, <laughs> the fortress mosque, but nowadays it is the Church of St. Vitus, Sveti uh, uh, um, Sveti Vid Tsukva. So uh, again, architecturally unmistakable yet anonymous. Rather than any gesture to an Ottoman past or architectural uh, Muslim architectural heritage, what you find in Sveti Vid Tsukva today is a much more uh, contemporary sort of uh, ensemble of symbols and signs and messages. In particular, I don't know if this is uh, in, on my computer now, I, you can't see all of this, but uh, when I visited uh, last June, which is uh, indeed a, a telling uh, date, um, uh, given that at the time, as some of you who are familiar with Croatian uh, public affairs might remember, this was during the debate over Mirela Chavaida, who was taken to have, uh, she was meant, to, uh, she had a, a tragic story, her, her, her, fetus in her womb was diagnosed with a brain tumor that was fatal, yet she was told she would have to go to Slovenia to get an abortion. This became part of a huge sort of cultural politics debate in Croatia, where uh, abortion has been, uh, of course, a flashpoint for many years. Um, this is, of course, uh, particularly politicized by a group on the right led by Jelka Markic, uh, the uh, Ime Obiteli, or in the name of the family. And you have this sort of anti-abortion imagery all over uh, the interior of the church. So again, just a, a a fascinating and striking uh, appropriation of uh, uh, ultimately Ottoman architectural space for much more contemporary uh, uh, battles, as it were. Now, battles are quite important in Klis in general, as you might not be surprised uh, to learn. Uh, you have fantasies of enmity, as you might put it, or as I've put it, uh, reenactments of the siege of, uh, the, uh, of, of Klis in 1537. Now, of course, this was a siege in which the Uskoks, the men of fortune and pirateering irregulars lost. Petar Kruzic uh, was uh, defeated, and the Ottomans, of course, took over the fortress. Uh, but nonetheless, you have, uh, I've taken one of these images from the web, as you can see, so it's not very very, uh, very clear, but you have these reenactments. Engaged in the reenactments are these so-called, uh, this contemporary group, the Klischke Uskoksi, or the Uskoks of Klis, who themselves were formed from a, a, a decommissioned uh, military unit from the Homeland War in the 1990s. They formed in 2005. They were a group from the, I think they were called the Pautzi, the spiders, uh, but now they are devoted to the reenactment of this Uskok uh, historical uh, heritage, na nationalist, of course. Uh, and there's one key irony that I haven't yet told you about that I will. Now, all of this sort of fantasy uh, of the past is 
in some sense, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about Game of Thrones, but I do think it's important to note that this was also a site in the Game of Thrones uh, filming in Croatia, and therefore you have, as in many places in Dubrovnik and Split and elsewhere, this Game of Thrones sort of uh, discursive surround, which suggests that fantasies of the past and fantasies of the mass media universe don't necessarily uh, achieve clear distinction from one another. Let me just highlight, though, for you the nationalist irony here vis-a-vis -vis the heritage presented at police. Uh, it's, of course, all that you have here, it's a shrine to the Uskoks, these sort of proto-nationalist warrior figures. And yet there's no mention of the fact that the Ottoman who led the siege of Klis uh, and succeeded in overthrowing the Uskoks was one Morat Beg Tardic from not, uh, you know, the center of Anatolia or the Levant, but Shibenik. So again, uh, the uh, Ottoman who overthrew the castle was as local as uh, the Uskoks who were defending it. And yet the ironies of heritage in the nation state require that only certain forms of historical remembering are authorized. Um, and again, what that all has to do with Game of Thrones still remains to be seen. But finally, let's go to uh, the, uh, the center of Sarajevo, a place that I imagine many of you are familiar with. Here, I'm really drawing quite a lot in particular on the wonderful work of, uh, of Maximilian Hart with my colleague uh, at the University of Vienna and his ERC uh, group there on uh, the Habsburg Orientalist uh, architectural heritage of Bosnia. Um, but I wanna talk a bit about Sebil uh, or Sebil, uh, the fountain which has become this iconic uh, site in Sarajevo and of and for Sarajevo. So um, as Max uh, puts it, a fountain not neo-Baroque style, but a masterly copy of an intricately ornamented Ottoman Sebil is now proudly, but erroneously reported to be a monument from the Turkish period. So again, here you can already tell what the irony that I'll be sort of drawing out is. Uh, just to briefly go through this, on the left here, you see uh, the original fountain, which was commissioned in 1753 um, by Mehmet Pasha Kukavica, uh, and then uh, that, uh, for reasons that I'm not entirely clear on, I haven't, I haven't quite figured this out, but for one reason or another, it was replaced in 1891 during the Habsburg era, of course, after um, uh, after uh, the, uh, the uh, Treaty of Berlin in 1878, uh, the Habsburgs take over uh, uh, administration of, uh, of Bosnia-Herzegovina before annexing it entirely in 1908, 1908 or 1909, 1908, I think. Um, but it was Alexander Vitek, uh, interestingly enough, a native of, of Sisak, uh, not so far away from here in Croatia, uh, uh, uh, one of the key architects of that Habsburg era in Sarajevo who designed this Orientalist fountain. And there you see it, of course, today. Um, Seville has become this key symbol for not only for Sarajevo, but in some sense, a condensation uh, and a semiotic sort of cipher for its oriental character. So uh, uh, on the right there, you see uh, an image from uh, the Charsha in Sarajevo. Uh, you know, this is, I think, a, um, a, a water flask of some sort with the Sebil. My favorite restaurant here in Zagreb, uh, Sofra, which is a Bosnian restaurant, will serve you your Bosnian coffee on these small sort of, you know, uh, bronze plates, which all have Sebil on them. You also have the other icon of Sarajevo there, of course, Vučko, who was the, uh, um, the mascot of the uh, Sarajevo uh, Olympics in, in the 80s, uh, who, about whom this is not, uh, I could say other things, but not now. But I want to talk a bit about this other image you see here. I purchased this book, Sarai Bosna Birulian in Bashkenti, uh, at a Dianet bookstore when I was most recently in Istanbul last month. And I just need to read to you the translation about Sebil from uh, this uh, from this uh, uh, this this book for children in Turkish about Sarajevo because I think it, it really epitomizes the sort of ironies of Orientalist heritage. Sebils are fountains. This is a quote that I've translated. Okay, my time is up, but I think I will finish within five minutes. Sebils are fountains that are erected in squares with the intention that passersby drink while they are thirsty and sit on the stairs for a spell and that birds too should have their share of shade and water. During the Ottoman era, 156 Sebils were built in Bosnia-Herzegovina by lovers of good deeds. Today, the only one that remains is the Sebil of Boschartia. 
the Sebil. The Sebil was constructed in 1753 by Governor Haji Mehmet Pasha based on the model of fountains in Istanbul and was recreated in 1891 in a manner that reflects the influence of Andalusian arts and crafts. The elegant fountain with its wooden dome is a meeting place for Bosnians, tourists, and pigeons alike. Uh, so what this doesn't mention, of course, is the Habsburg era at all. The Andalusian uh, gesture is, at least according to my art historical friends, entirely off. And yet it's still, it's a way of sort of domesticating something that was in fact an Austro-Hungarian intervention upon the cityscape as the authentic Orientalist heritage. Uh, very briefly, um, Sebil has gone global, as some of you might know. In, in 1989, there was a, a, a replica put in the Skadarlia neighborhood of Belgrade as a sign of uh, ironic, <laughs> in its own way, a sign of uh, brotherhood and unity between the two cities. Uh, then in uh, the 2007-2008 uh, or so, you have this one on the lower right in Birmingham at the Bosnian Cultural Center, which was not a replica, obviously, but more an, a sort of uh, interpretation. You have another replica now in, in St. Louis on the upper right. That was from 2013-2014. Uh, so again, I think there's a lot to be thought of about this deterritorialized iconicity of Sebil. Um, and this, of course, goes more generally toward the sort of architectural orientalism as irony, which is uh, uh, applies to other symbols of the city as well. In particular, Vietznitsa, uh, the iconic building that was destroyed during the war, uh, also designed by Vitek, the same architect I mentioned before, built in 1892 to 1894. Vitek committed suicide in Graz during that time, so it had to be finished by another architect, but that's another story. Um, here you see um, some images of, of that kind of high orientalist neo-Moorish building as the another symbol of the city. The one on the left I've given you, in some ways, just to be provocative, it's a, it's a sticker on a lamppost in uh, Turg Bana Yelachicha here in uh, Zagreb. You can see the symbol of Zagreb in the background, the uh, statue of Ban Yelachic, but there you have this, sim this sort of sticker representing Sarajevo, which has, among other things, Latinska Chupria, Sebil is in the middle, Vietznica is in the back, and then you can see the towers uh, of both the Orthodox and Catholic Church. So again, the irony here, of course, being that the authentic, the sort of myth of authenticity of the Oriental urban symbol requires that the history uh, of the city be at least muted, if not entirely silenced, when the symbol, that is to say, the fountain, Sebil, is presented. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I had a whole bunch of stuff I was going to say by way of a conclusion about dangerous neo-imperial ironies that opens up to a lot of other uh, matters vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our project and my research. Uh, just briefly to say you have here the Suleiman Shah Turbesi, uh, which has inspired a militant uh, identification on the part of Turkmen brigades in northern Syria fighting alongside Turkish forces. Meanwhile, you have white nationalists and their own neo-imperial uh, memories, uh, whether it be the Gates of Vienna, which inspired such horrific figures such as Anders Bering Brevik, or the Ruskoya Imperioska uh, Djevinia, the Russian imperial movement, which uh, has connections with the now infamous Wagner group. So anyhow, there's a lot more to be said about how rendering the ironies of these sorts of appropriations of imperial heritage is something that's politically incumbent upon scholars uh, of the imperial past in the present today, but I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Sharimi and, uh, and Abdul Hamid is very too to exciting talks we are looking forward to reading the books that will come out of your <laughs> your research uh, good luck thanks for joining everyone uh, the next installment of our platform uh, takes place on april 19th uh, with uh, two talks again petro negura from the ios regensburg will speak about popular resistance to linguistic assimilation in the romanian polish and soviet borderlands in the interwar period and then nicole dragushin who is a fellow at uh, at cast sofia uh, gives a presentation on romania and the concordat with the holy see churches nation building and legal controversies also in the interwar period so again a pair that fits nicely into exciting uh, topics and uh, we are looking forward to seeing you again goodbye take care and uh, see you soon again thanks so much ciao thanks Jeremy. Abdurrahman. goodbye